But without further delay, we actually have a guest in our studio, and he's been hanging out with us uh, this morning and letting us kind of chat through. But we got Birch Bragg here from Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub. Thanks so much for being here this morning. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure to be here, guys. So uh, we got there's some fun and exciting stuff coming up uh, for you all. But before we get too much into it, uh, tell us just kind of an overview of, of Locals and uh, what all you guys do and just sort of remind folks where you are too. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that opportunity because yeah. we still have people coming in the store every day. We've been <laughs> open for about a year and a half, approaching yeah. two years uh, who have been there for the first time. Mm-hmm. So it feels like a good, well-kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> we want to try to avoid that. Um, yeah, so we are located at 863 Wilkinson Boulevard mm-hmm. uh, next to Poppy's Donuts uh, across from Douglas Tire and Lime Water. Uh, we purchased the building back about two years ago uh, and started making renovations then. Um, so we're open seven days a week from uh, 11 o'clock in the morning until 8 o'clock at night on Sunday through Thursday and until 9 o'clock at night on Friday and Saturday. Uh, and our business concept is really unique in that we have a locally sourced restaurant and a local grocery in the same space. So on the restaurant side, you can find locally sourced wood-fired pizzas, salads, appetizers, soups, but we just about take those off. We change our menu twice a year, once in the winter, once in the summer, to reflect what's seasonally available. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a 10-tap draft system, only Kentucky beers. It's all we carry. All of our wines, just Kentucky wines, and most of our non-alcoholic beverages, just Kentucky beverages. The whole point there is to showcase the amazing breadth and depth of product, which is in Kentucky. Um, and so if you move over to the grocery side, every single product, it's about a 500 square foot retail grocery space. Every product that we carry on the groceries from a small Kentucky producer uh, or farmer. So uh, nothing out of state, nothing out of season. You won't find watermelons there in March or strawberries in January. Uh, and we encourage people to take 30% of your food budget, set it aside for local food. So that's coming to locals or going to our farmer's market. We have an amazing farmer's market here. Or buying directly from a farmer uh, on farm, participate in CSA. But set aside 25 30% of your food budget, buy local food, go to the Broadline grocery stores, get the rest of the stuff you need that we don't have. Uh, so we call that the local food challenge. What, where, where did you all come up with the idea? I mean, had you seen it in other places or was it a mix of a few different things? Because it's, it's such a unique, yeah. cool concept. Yeah, well, thanks for that. Appreciate it, Harvey. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's kind of a hodgepodge uh, of ideas that all culminated and came together. So in August of 2020, my wife uh, and our other two business partners, Taylor Marshall and Joseph Fiala, uh, were all really good friends. Um, and in August of 2020, post-pandemic, Uh, So if you guys remember uh, vividly, um, grocery store shelves were empty. I think probably some of the first time that a lot of folks experienced that, Mm -hmm. the fragility of the globalized supply chain of food, Mm -hmm. as well as all kinds of other products. Uh, You know, America is the land of plenty. And I think for us, when we go somewhere to buy something and we aren't allowed to do that or don't have that ability (laughs) or it's out of stock, that's a really weird thing for us. Um, And so, you know, I think... The interesting thing is that that fragility has always been there, um, but only in times of calamity, pandemic, wars, uh, recessions, et cetera, do we really get to feel that viscerally and understand kind of what does that mean to me and my mm-hmm. family, right? Um, so we were committed to wanting to uh, add to the solution of making it easier for people to buy local food and to try to increase the resilience and build the strength of our existing local food system. and. You know, it's interesting, um, we kind of went through a few different iterations or ideas of how do we, you know, conceptualize the store and this business. And so my first foray into local food was in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So I went to Western Kentucky University, um, <clears throat> graduated in 2005, and um, went out west for a while, uh, had some really fun adventures out there, and then moved back to Bowling Green in 2012. And uh, not long after that, I started a farm. So it was kind of my first foray into local food. Mm -hmm. And it was just outside the city limits of Bowling Green. And we were a diversified market farm, meaning that we sold uh, all manner of vegetables. Um, We had high tunnels, so we did field crops as well as indoor greenhouse growing. We had an acre of blueberries. We had pastured pork, poultry, and eggs, honeybees. We developed a non-traditional market CSA, uh, which was online, so people could order weekly items they wanted in our CSA, and we carried all kinds of other farmers' products in addition to ours, which at the time was fairly new concept or new idea. Uh, we sold at farmers markets in Nashville and Bowling Green. Uh, one of the things that set us apart in that farm was Beachmont Farms. Um, 
one of the things that set us apart is we had wood-fired pizzas locally sourced on a portable oven uh, that we would load onto a 20-foot trailer every Friday night along with the three compartment sink and all the things to have a viable portable health department certified mm-hmm. kitchen but then all the coolers of produce and meats and all the other things we sold so we would show up at about 4 30 in the morning on saturday morning at the <laughs> at the parking lot where sky farmers market at the time was being held uh and we would fire up the oven and we would begin getting all the preparations ready and so back then 2013 is when we started that farm we were selling wood fired pizzas locally sourced and produce mm-hmm. and meats and everything else so you know i think the origins of local um, locals food hub and pizza pub really stem from there because that was something that we were familiar with i love pizza my wife can tell you she won't let me eat pizza when we go out anymore even though i want to try it everywhere um you know so and i think pizza is a wonderful vehicle to carry some yeah. really high quality premium local ingredients because you don't need a whole lot of each of those items right mm-hmm. and so the price point is is typically fairly high on a lot of local food and so that's a way that we can kind of keep that packaged in a way that is reasonable and affordable and accessible to most members of our society. Uh, So yeah, pizza being a fantastic vehicle to carry those local food products. Um, And the idea there is, so full disclosure, 75% of our revenue is from the restaurant side, uh, 25% of our revenue is from the grocery side, right? And the idea there is that beer and people, beer and pizza bring people in the door. Mm -hmm. And so if they've never participated in a local food system before, now by default, by ordering our food and drinking the beer, they have now participated in local food because that's what we offer. Um, And our hope is that in the 15 minutes while they're waiting for their pizza, they walk over to the grocery side, they start making connections. And whether they actually make a full-on purchase that day and and really dive into the local food consumption, or if they just make connections in their mind about, oh, this is Brandon Men and Buck's farm. He lives right down the road from me. I'll have to try this next time I come in. Or, oh, wow, they carry a lot of cool stuff. You know, I'll bring my family in here. That's the idea. We're trying to make it easier for folks to buy local food. I would say you talked about the fragility of the supply chain and stuff, and I would think that the local source is a little more resilient to that, right? Because they're... It's still just from farm to day, you know, farm to the store. Hundred you know, percent. So yeah, it's that's a, great that you guys were able to sort of leverage that in right. in this new space. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that that I always talk about when because we talk about things happening at locals, and I said that the, the, the thing that I always love about going there is you can go in without an idea about what you want to eat that night. Like not necessarily the restaurant side on the grocery mm-hmm. side, and just see like well, what looks good. Like should we do salads tonight, or should we do pasta or sandwiches or whatever? Mm-hmm. And so. That's that's my favorite part of the store. Nice. But that's not really a question. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Opinion. Uh, we talked about like you know it carrying this these local foods to the people and going and having it available where the people are. Mm-hmm. Uh, you all were awarded a, a grant right from the USDA. Yeah. To uh, literally bring food to people's doorsteps, right? Exactly. With the food uh, delivery system here. Yeah. Yeah. Talk yeah. About we're that really about. excited about that. It's actually the second uh, USDA nationally competitive grant that we've won so far. Uh, the first was, was with the Healthy Food and Financing Initiative, uh, and we received $200 on that, and uh, that is going to help us facilitate the opening of a second store in Louisville, so mm-hmm. we'll get into that in a minute. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, and then the grant that you're referring to is the Local Food Promotion Grant, and uh, we wrote that grant to develop a grocery delivery service and a box program. Um, that we can deliver to the doorsteps uh, with a really strong underserved community component involved there. Uh, Because how do we make it easier for people to buy local food? Well, we drop it off at their door. Mm -hmm. In today's world, in the just-in-time, pick up the phone and order anything, and I want it here in 30 minutes on my Mm -hmm. doorstep. You know, I think that's where the future is heading, especially for groceries. And that's not a concept original to me. I I would like to claim that. But, uh, you know, a really interesting story about Kroger, who we're all very familiar with, the biggest grocery uh, restaurant or grocery retailer in the world, Mm. uh, with all the number of brands uh, of other groceries that they own and uh, throughout the country and and the world. Um, So they had never been in the Florida market. You know, Publix is is Mm -hmm. based in Florida and they dominated that Mm -hmm. market for decades. And only recently in the last couple of years have they entered into the Florida market. Mm. And they did so not with a retail grocery store, but they did so with a massive warehouse with robots and delivery vehicles. Mm. So at that store, you can't walk in and buy food. 
It's simply a delivery system mechanism that they put in place. So if people like that, who are that well-funded and that mm -hmm. knowledgeable about the future of grocery and where consumer behavior is leading, you know, if, if they're investing in that, you know, we'll take a cue from that and, and, and say, yeah, we, we need to develop a robust delivery um, program ourselves. So really excited about that. Do you all have a timeline on where, when it'll be available or? Well, that's a good question. You know, it's a three year grant. <laughs> okay. uh, we are working to kind of get all of the pieces in place as far as the coordinator of the program who we've already hired. Um, you know, there's a, a rental of a refrigerated truck and then hiring of driver and some other personnel, mm -hmm. um, you know, establishing an e-commerce software uh, to where you can go online and there's a really seamless site. That's probably mm -hmm. our biggest challenge mm -hmm. is finding that software because we're a very unique model um, to where you can come in and you can buy an item in the store and it is directly immediately in real time reflected online sure. so that you're not selling a product that has right. already been purchased Imagine and there's a lag. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's a little little trick there that we're working on, but mm -hmm. hopefully within the next two months to three months, we can have that up and going. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you kind of briefly touched on it, but tell us a little bit about the, the Smoke Town uh, in Louisville, Smoke Town neighborhood yeah. that you all are expanding into. Uh, yeah, really looking excited. Looking forward next year, right? Yeah, yeah, next year. Uh, real excited about this uh, project. You know, um, since the beginning, we've always known that Frankfurt was going to be our prototype store, if you will. We've always had plans. Uh, we meet yearly with our partners and we have a day long meeting where we all kind of reassess our goals and we alter them and change them if we need to. But we always put a 10 year plan out forward. So we're always on the same page. We're always everything we do. All of our energy is focused towards mm -hmm. that direction of that long term goal. Uh, and that long term goal involves several stores throughout the state mm -hmm. um, because really what we're doing can be done in so many communities, you know. Um, yeah, so we chose uh, Louisville as our second location, and Smoketown neighborhood is a really interesting neighborhood. Uh, it is located in a USDA uh, food desert, which is critically important to our food access mission, to be able to be in a place where we can provide an immediate impact on food access with nutrient-dense foods. Um, and it's also close enough to a lot of family neighborhoods. Uh, you know, it's just so the location we're looking at is two blocks north of Logan Street Market, if you're familiar with that. It's East Breckenridge and Lambton uh, or Logan Street where they meet. Uh, it's going to be in that area. So that's really exciting. And it's close enough to neighborhoods who can really support cash flow of the business. So mm -hmm. that's kind of our sweet spot. That's mm -hmm. where we need to be. Uh, we're looking for in August. Um, the construction will begin. It's actually brand new construction. So we've partnered with Beargrass Development out of Louisville, who owns about four acres in this particular location. Uh, so really excited to work with them as partners, too. They've uh, kind of cut their teeth and been known in that area for affordable housing projects they've done. Um, so a lot of our values are, are similar and aligned, so they're going to be some great partners in Louisville. Um, so we we're hoping to be open for Derby maybe a month before Derby starts in 2024. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like with the new construction, it's probably going to be closer to a 10-month project, so it'll probably be after Derby. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, but that's nice. Around June or so of 2024 is most likely when that'll happen, mm -hmm. which is a fantastic time in Kentucky because that's when you see your first tomatoes mm -hmm. and okay. uh, peppers and all the summer products really start coming on. And that's when we see in our sales, um, that's when we see a big jump on the produce side. Do you, will there be an overlap uh, of providers, you know, because obviously you're dealing with certain folks today in mm -hmm. Frankfurt, uh, or is it a whole new group of, of farms and providers in Louisville, yeah. or is there some overlap? Or Yeah, it's a great question. Like? Um, there will be some overlap for sure. So, for instance, Kenny's Farmhouse Cheese out of Barron County. Uh, he's been making artisan cheeses for over 20 years here in the state, so he's kind of a premier cheese maker. Uh, we source our mozzarella for our pizzas in 40-pound blocks from him. Mm. Um, I've already had the conversation with him about our expansion uh, into Louisville, and we're, we're factoring that Louisville is going to be at least 2 or 3x what we're doing in Frankfurt, just given the size of the metro population mm. and you know everything else, right? And, and potentially could be 4 or 5x. Um, so that's exciting, but as part of that, you know, I can't just call a broadline distributor and order more cheese, right? right? I have to make <laughs> to sure to that our supply right. chain, yeah. who we've developed from scratch, yeah. you know, at this point, we've spent over $650,000 with 120 plus mm -hmm. uh, Kentucky producers, you know, and that mm -hmm. statistic alone is why we exist, because mm -hmm. we're trying to make an impact on our local food system. And part of doing that is providing a, an outlet for the goods that are being produced by our farmers all mm -hmm. around. Um, so that they can continue to stay in business doing what they do. Um, you know, so uh, that's, that's something we're deeply proud of. But yeah, in this example, so we had to make sure that he can continue making enough mozzarella, and he said he can for this yeah. store. So cool. um, 
so yeah, there'll be overlap from him and Legacy Dairy is out of Barron County as well. So Barron County was a really strong tobacco producing county mm -hmm. back prior to the federal uh, settlement and the mm -hmm. tobacco buyout. Mm -hmm. And so the neat thing about Kentucky, just as a little sidebar, um, you know, at the state level, Kentucky Department of Ag, there was a whole lot of foresight when that money, because a tremendous amount of money mm -hmm. allocated over 25 years started coming through in the late 90s, uh, also went to Virginia, North Carolina, and other tobacco producing states. What we did differently and we did really well as a state is we put that money aside and earmarked it for agricultural diversification projects. Um, and so what that's done, Kenny is a perfect example, Kenny's Farmhouse Cheese, uh, they were tobacco producers and he also had uh, dairy cows. And so once they got bought out on that, he then said, well, I've got dairy cows, I make my own milk. Let's go ahead and turn that milk instead of selling as fluid milk. Mm. Um, let's turn that into a value added product like cheese, mm. right? And so Kentucky's been great about helping support farmers transition from what used to be a commodity product like tobacco into something uh, that we eat or something that's more sustainable to grow and sell. Well, uh, I think before we let you go, we so appreciate you coming on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before we let you go, I think we got to ask you, uh, we always try to ask our guests a question of the day. Uh -huh. So we're asking folks out there, if they're watching on Facebook or cable and chiming in on text machine, uh, some top priorities on the bucket list. What on comes to mind list. for you? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I so we recently went to Puerto Rico. Uh, first time I've been there since fourth grade. Uh, my late mom... Uh, side of the family is from there. Yeah, um, we were there for a while, and my kids and all of us fell in love with it. So I would say bucket list is to find a tiny piece of property mm. on Puerto Rico, just as our beach getaway down the road whenever we have some time. I <laughs> yeah. think that's on our bucket that's list. Awesome. Yeah. I was going to say, uh, it sounded like for a second you were trying to expand locals in Puerto Rico. <laughs> well, maybe but... that's how we do it. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's, that, that's a great idea, Zach. Yeah. Thanks for that. We'll, uh, we'll be, we'll be yeah. working on that. <laughs> well, Bersh, thanks so much for, for coming on the show again from Locals Food Hub and Pizza Pub. We really appreciate you uh, taking time out and speaking to our viewers. Today. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you very much for the yeah. opportunity. Thanks for being a part of the community and yeah, all that you do. Yeah, so. you bet. Mm -hmm.